Welcome to Centre Church. We hope you enjoy this message recorded live from our Burgess Hill campus. We, we've been over the last several weeks talking about um, 2 Timothy. We've been going through 2 Timothy. There's been the theme of entrusted. There we are. The slides. Uh, the theme's been entrusted. It's about the whole idea of Timothy being entrusted by Paul with the message of faith, with the, the gospel message, encouraging him, discipling him, and discipling others and encouraging others, and getting Timothy to do just the same thing. Today we're going to finish off with the last bit. Um, do you know, um, there are some big chunks in this passage that have got lots in them, and so we're going to read through it, but there's bits here that I want to pick out, and I want to focus down on just three core verses, and in the end we may even just go down to one, depends how much um, uh, hot air I generate before we get there, um, and how much I talk. Um, so, but the, 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 the title, if you like, that I've given for, for this message today is Entrusted, Leaving a Faith Legacy. Leaving a Faith Legacy. And I, and I don't know about you, but we all leave a legacy. You might not realise that, but we all leave a legacy of some sort. It's either a good legacy, or it's a legacy that actually we wouldn't be proud of at the end of the day. What sort of legacy are we leaving behind? Hopefully we're all leaving behind a good legacy, yes? Yes. Okay, so we're going to affirm that before we even start today by turning to our neighbour and saying, I'm leaving a good legacy. Okay? And that's for... And that's for everybody, it's for the youngest, for the oldest, for everyone. We're all building a good legacy, if we choose to, today. So let's read, we're going to be reading from, um, it's 2 Timothy 4, and it starts at verse 6, it goes to verse 22. On the screen we've got the first few verses, we're going to keep going right through them. It'll take a moment, because it's a long passage, uh, so bear with me, but I think it's important to read the context. Um, you know, uh, when we were, um, when we were, uh, at uh, Polytechnic, we, we um, had visit of, of a number of different speakers, and one of those speakers had this great phrase, and you've probably heard it before, that a, a Bible text out of context is a con text. Yeah? So it's really important for us to make sure that we read the word in its context, so that's what we're <laughs> going to do. So, starting at verse 6. For I, am a, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Paul's referring back to the Old Testament and the idea that the drink offering was the end of the sacrificial system, the end of a sacrifice at the temple. And it's time for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, there is in store for me the crown, or the Stephanos, the, the victor's crown, the victor's garland of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So that's Paul talking about the present, the past, and the future. And then he comes back into the moment and he says, Do your best to come to me quickly, Timothy, for, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Um, Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Mark and Paul had had a disagreement back in Acts. They'd gone apart. Mark was, had gone back home. He'd given up. But apparently Mark has been restored and Mark's back again. And Paul's saying, bring him because actually he's a great guy and he's, I really want him to be with me because there's something still to impart and something that he can do for me and for the gospel. Lost my place now. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. I said, I my life, Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, it's going to be like that, there's more through here. Um, <laughs> when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Paul wasn't thinking, he was there at the end of his life, and yet he wasn't thinking of giving up yet. He's saying, no, bring my scrolls, scrolls, bring the parchments, there's stuff I've got to do, there's teaching I've got to give, there's learning I need to learn. It's amazing, even right then, at the end of his life, facing death, he was still calling for those things. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. 
you too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through the message, through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. And that's not just a figure of speech. He was facing the possibility of going into the Colosseum and facing the lions. Wow. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. What an assurance. And will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then almost as an afterthought. Oh, by the way, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anisiphorus. Uh, uh, Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus, but do your best to get here, he's repeating it again, do your best, Timothy, to get here. Before winter, Eubulus greets you and so do Pulins, Linus, Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you. It just shows, doesn't it, that Paul there in his death, or almost at his death, on his deathbed, he's thinking about all the people around him, the relationships and all that he's still got going on in his life. He still wants to leave something behind. He still wants to impart something. He wants his legacy to continue. There's, um, I want to particularly focus on these verses. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for departure is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me this victor's garland of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, to all who have longed for his appearing. Some of you will know um, the, the author and, um, uh, and teacher, the leadership teacher, uh, John Maxwell. You've heard of John Maxwell? Some of you, maybe? Okay. Some of you like John Maxwell. Good. Um, uh, John Maxwell came up with the 21 laws of leadership, and one of those key laws of leadership is the law of legacy that we leave a legacy and what legacy is it we leave behind. And commenting on these verses, John Maxwell says, Paul's deathbed was no place for sorrow. He'd planted churches, mentored leaders, established doctrine and written epistles. The only thing left was his homecoming. Paul saw life as a race to be run, a battle to be fought and a trust to be kept. And his crown, his victor's crown, his Stephanos, his garland to prove that he'd won the race awaited him. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's how I want to finish. But not just that, that's how I want to live now. Yeah? It's not just how I want to finish. I don't want to just get there at the end and go, well, that's it. I want to live that way now. Some of you know my story. Some of you know that, um, I'm going off piste here. Uh, but some of you know that um, growing up, I was 13, my dad died when he was 50, so I was 13, dad passed away. From that moment on, I was like, well, what's life? Do you know? What is it all about? It took me on a journey. Five years later, I discovered, because uh, I was asking the question, is there life after death? Uh, five years later, I discovered Christianity. I became a Christian, discovered that there was a, 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 the ability to be able to have eternal life and an assurance that we could go to heaven when we die. That was amazing news to me. But it also pushed me to decide that I wanted to make my life count. I had my midlife crisis, quite honestly, at 25. But I did because I thought, am I halfway through? You know? I was I half, but no, no. I know that I've got many years still to come because I've got a calling placed on my life and I know that that calling hasn't been fulfilled yet. God's promised me things that I haven't, I haven't seen yet. And I'm sure that's true for you guys as well. And you know, until it's the right time, you will remain in this body. Mm, it's amazing. Paul, let's go back. See, three things. Verse 6. Well, I've broken it down into some headings. Can we flip to the next one? The next slide. And again. One more. That's it. Perfect. Yes. So, well, the idea is they're entrusted leaving a faith legacy, and Paul's reflecting on these things, and you know, it's almost a little bit like um, a Christmas carol. It's uh, um, the past, the present, and the future. It's my little Christmas nod. <laughs> it's not quite Christmas yet. It's not even Advent yet, but there we are. Um, 
one. Okay. So I thought there was, I've sort of given these three titles, Life of Faith Present, Life of Faith, faith Past, and Life of Faith Future. I'm going to spend a bit of time around Life of Faith Past, but we're going to touch on present and future because that contextualizes it as well. So we start off with this Life of Faith Present, the idea that faith, the faith offering, faith's offering, there's, there we go. And Paul, you know, Paul wrote to the Romans, and uh, as we know, and again, that was also um, um, a time when he spoke about discipleship and he spoke about many things. But one of the things he spoke about, Romans 12, 1 and 2, anybody know it? Yes, yes. In light of these mercies, then, then let's not um, allow ourselves to be conformed to this, to this world around us, but let's be transformed and let's be living sacrifices day to day, giving ourselves as an offering every moment of every day. And Paul command, or suggested, could say commanded, um, is here was to do that. And Paul had that idea in his mind, didn't he, of being a living sacrifice. And here he is coming to the end of his life and he's saying, I have done that. I have been that living sacrifice. Because just like the Old Testament, the end of the sacrifice was the drink offering being poured out. He's now saying, I've done that and I'm this drink offering. I haven't gone yet, but I'm on my way. I'm on my way. But he's also saying, as I mentioned, he's not really giving up. He's not saying, that's it, I'm over. He's saying, you know, Timothy, come to me as soon as you can, before winter if you can, because, you know, there's important things to do. Bring Mark, bring the scrolls. I've got stuff to do. There's things to still achieve. Do you know, it's really, I don't know about you, but I find that really inspiring when I'm around people that are like that, when I'm around other Christians, other believers, whether that be in the workplace, in the home, or whether that be in church life. Do you know, that really inspires me. Can you think of those people that, that maybe inspired you in those ways, those people that continued in their faith, that left that legacy behind? Do you know, we've got IBTI folks here, and Johnny, forgive me for mentioning it, but I think we should do, you know, there's a legacy there that, that planted this church from the IBTI. What's that legacy? Well, the legacy goes back from Johnny and Eliana and the current students through, and the staff that are there, through to, to Jean-Jacques Spinden and John Wildrian, who links, link us back to the founder, Fred Squires, who link us back to the founders, or if you like, those people that, that pioneered the Pentecostal movement back in the 1900s, people like Smith Wigglesworth, who, who there's a photo of, of, um, of um, Mrs. Spinden, I can't remember her first name, Mrs. Spinden, you know, as a girl with Smith Wigglesworth, there, there was translations that were done by Jean-Jacques Spinden for, this, for, for, um, for folks like um, the, the um, oh goodness, I'm forgetting all the people, but anyway, those pioneers, <laughs> those pioneers, these aren't in my notes, so. <laughs> but you know, we, we, we're connected to people by this legacy. Yeah. There, there's, and that's, through the college, and that's amazing, that's great, and that's church, if you like. But then there's, there's those people just in ordinary life. You know, there, there's one couple I know of who I won't name for, for reasons that will become apparent, um, uh, in their 80s, and um, even still in their 80s, when they're down the shops, when they're, they've got somebody coming to their home doing a, a job for them, or, or even when they're in hospital, they're pulling out the New Testament and giving it to them and saying, maybe you should have a read of that. What a legacy they're leaving behind. Challenging for me. Challenging for all of us. And, you know, we've had those folks here in our church. You know, I could mention names, and some of you have been around for a while will remember people like Ernest Walton Lucy. Do anybody remember Ernest? Some of you might, one or two might. Ernest was founded the London Embankment Mission, and in 1969 it was written of him that he was the Archbishop to the gutter, and he had some of his last years here in our church. Um, I know someone who particularly inspired me when we first joined in this church, uh, I don't want to say quite how many years ago that was, uh, and that was someone that, that I always referred to because I felt it was respectful, was Miss Brown, Margaret Brown, um, Pauline's auntie. Do you know there are those people who perhaps seem like the ordinary folks who actually are the heroes of the faith? Yeah. We, we can all be that yeah. Yeah. for somebody else. Do you know another Maxwellism is 
that to be a leader, you only have to be one step in front of somebody else. That's all. If I'm one step in front of you and you're following me, you're a leader. I'm a leader. We can all be leaders. We can all lead other people. Okay, I've spent far too long on that, but once again, maybe turn to the opposite neighbour today and say, I'm leaving a good legacy. Come on. That's great, that's great. So now we move on. The good fight, I have fought. So, no. Yes, thank you. If we look at verse 7, verse 7, as I read it, and as I read it in the NIV and most modern translations, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. But actually, in the Greek word order, it's a bit more like listening to Yoda. He says, the good fight... It says, actually says, the good fight I have fought, but you can almost think it being Yodaistic, sort of, the good fight fought have I. You know, because, it, because Paul is trying to say it's not about me, it's about actually the thing that's happened. It's not about me, it's about the grace that God's working through me and in me. So the good fight I have fought, the race or the course I have run, the faith I have kept. It's not about Paul, it's about what Paul's been able to do because of God's grace working through him. Really, and wow, and he says that, you know, he says that in 1 Corinthians 1.10, there's a, a bunch of different uh, verses that I could have referred to even up till now, but haven't, but this one I'm going to read, but by the grace of God, this is Paul speaking, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect, it had a purpose, it had an effect, no, I worked harder than all of them, it was grace, but Paul worked harder than all of them. It was grace, but there was a response to it. It was something that came from God. It was a merited favour, yes, it was favour on his life, but Paul took action based on it. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. That's Paul's thinking. That's how he thinks it through. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Mm. So, faith contended for. He fought the good fight. And you know, this is something, this is a theme that, 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 that uh, Paul had. He'd already mentioned it to Timothy. Anybody remember where he did that? Was it in this letter or the previous letter? First or second Timothy? Come on, it's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> first Timothy, yes, 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 thank you, thank you. So, first Timothy 6.12, Paul says... Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, were, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. There's this idea, fight the good fight, there's this idea of wrestling, of, of really struggling with. If you read it in, its, in, in the sort of the Greek translation, it's more about struggling. It's more about getting to overcome rather than necessarily fight as perhaps we might think of it today. The idea is that wrestling match or struggle to overcome something. And, you know, within that, there's this idea of, of overcoming ourselves, you know, discipline, disciplining ourselves. Do you remember Paul also says, I beat my body into, sub into submission, which is like, you know, oh, oh, no, flesh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this instead. And it's about our spirit being taking over because we need to live from our spirit, not from our mind and not from our flesh, but from our spirit guiding and directing us. Um, it's about wrestling with circumstances, contending for God's reality. Um, you know, we face circumstances, we face situations, we're facing circumstances and situations of, seems like every day that seem to change and seem to be different and seem to be difficult, whether that's in the world or whether that's in our own lives. And the reality comes to us and we start getting down and we start feeling that the reality is too much. But you know, as we wrestle with that, we start denying that reality as such. Not denying it as a reality, it is a reality, of course it is. But we're denying the finality of that reality because we know God is going to work his way through us and in that situation and overcome those things. And how does that happen? It happens by grace and it happens by us taking action, just like Paul did. 
We have the grace from him to know what is the right thing to do and we get on and do it and see that change. And wrestling with principalities and powers, there's a whole other sermon there that we could go into, Ephesians 6. And then we move to faith pursued. Finish the race or finish the course uh, is another way of... So the, the course, you know, like the course is mapped out. Um, I had a, a message just yesterday from someone who's going to be running the 2022 marathon in London. There's a course that's mapped out and, you know, I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon, but they are and good for them. But there's a course that is mapped out for each one of us. Um, and, uh, you know, Paul mentions this again, Acts 20, verse 24. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, finish the course, get to that final line, and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of what? God's grace. Wow. God calls each one of us to a particular path, to a specific calling, to a particular call in life, a course that we have to follow. Do you know, if we, we each of us have it, and we might turn, just like we leave a legacy, we each of us have a purpose. We've all been placed on this planet, in this location, at this time, for such a time as this, to see his kingdom come in and through our lives. We've all got a part to play in that. That part may be big, it may be small, but every one of us counts, and every one of us has an assignment. Some are called to be apostles, like Paul was. Some are called to be evangelists, yes, that's true. Some are called to be kingdom builders in the marketplace and influence there. Some are called to be teachers of young minds. Some to be, you know, prophetically creative in the media space. And others to build up others and encourage family and friends. We've all got a calling on our lives. Question for you. Do you know what that assignment is that you have? Do you know the calling that's on your life? What's God called you to? Think back. What are the words that he's given you? What are the promises he's given? What's that calling he's placed on your life? What is it that you need to see come about in your life to be able to say at the end of my race, did what God wanted me to do? Yeah? I just want us to stop a minute and think about that. What is it? It's not a rhetorical question. It really is a question we all need to answer. Because if we don't, and we miss it, and, you know, God is gracious and generous, and he won't let us miss it, because if we ask him, he will definitely give us the answer. But if we don't do that, can you imagine getting to the end and being that person at the end of life, at the end of the race, and saying, oh, I missed it, and then getting there before God and having him say to us, well done, almost good and faithful servant. Oh, well done, you nearly made it. It's not that we won't get to heaven because we will get the victor's crown, just like Jesus, uh, uh, Paul says, because Jesus has won that for us. It's about the extra rewards we might get. It's about getting that affirmation from God to say, yes, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but I'd like to hear that personally. I'd like to hear that. The Bible calls the life, life a race and one in which we should run in such a way as to gain the prize. Not because we're competing with anybody else, but because we ourselves need to have that motivation. To finish our race strong, to hear God say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm. Faith kept. One of the key aims of Paul's ministry was both teaching and strengthening people, the believers, in their faith. And once again, we hear, have it here that he says, you know, I have kept the faith. So in, again, in 1 Timothy 18, 19, Timothy, my son, I am giving you the command, this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you might fight the battle well. Holding on to faith, holding on to faith, and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have shipwrecked with regard to their faith. Holding on to the faith, staying strong in belief, believing the truth, living in truth. When the doubts come along, because doubts will, when those doubts come along, when you get the doubts that say, well, you know, will God really meet all of my needs? Can I really be healed of this condition? Will I, you know, actually go to heaven when I die? 
When those sort of doubts come along and we start questioning those things, someone has said that when we have the doubts, we need to start doubting the doubts. And we need to doubt the doubts and replace them with the Word of God. And what does the Word of God say? Well, it says, I will meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus. Mmm, good. By his stripes I am healed. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a place for me. There's words in the scriptures that will hit each one of our doubts. What so often is the case is that we're not willing to dig into the Bible and dig into the scriptures and find the word and the promise that deals with the doubt that we've got. And if you're not sure and you can't find it, there's lots of material out there. There's loads of resources. You can get books that, talk, that give you all the different promises in the Bible that you can work through and that are actually categorised. There's, there's, there's places on the internet you can go to, or better still, why don't you come and ask Tyler and he'll give you the answer. <laughs> Keep the faith, and then just finally, just closing, um, this idea of being entrusted and leaving a legacy. I've just gone back to page one. That's not the right one. Um, the life of faith and the future. Do you know, we've got this life of faith present where Paul talked about his situation, the life of faith <laughs> past, and just all that he's achieved, and the life of faith future. What is looking forward to? And as Paul looks to the end of his life, you know, he was there. He was at that point when he was almost being executed. He'd got through one defence, but he wasn't sure he was going to get through the next defence or the one after that. And he knew he was going to be executed at some point. We don't quite know how Paul ended his life. Some suggest that maybe he was beheaded. We don't know, but we know he was executed in some way. And as Paul looks to this end of his life here on earth, he knows he will receive a crown of righteousness. And there's two Greek words for crown. There's diadem, which is the royal crown, which is where we get the idea of uh, a stage where the, 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 the king sits. And then we've got the other one, which is a stephanos. And um, a stephanos, I may be pronouncing it wrong, but my, my older nephew's Greek and he's called stephanos, and so that's why I say it that way. Um, and a stephanos is, the, is the, the garland, the wreath that put, gets put round your head when you are the victor, when you're the winner. So, you know, or, or these days we might think of it as being um, the gold medal, if you like. It's that sort of thing. So it's that thing that notices, that sets you aside and says, you are the winner. You're a victor. You've won. You've got it. You've achieved. But it's all by grace. Yeah? yeah? Because, as Paul points out, it's that... It's that that, that amazing crown of righteousness that has been won for us by Jesus himself, not by us. And we have it because we're in Jesus. If you're a believer, if you know Jesus today, then you are in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, then you have all the rewards that he has, including that crown of life. Wow, that's amazing. So, that's, that's the reassurance. That's what we're targeting. That's what we're going for. We've got that reassurance. But you know, there's just a little bit more, isn't there? Because we also know in, in the... Um, Jesus taught in the, in the parable of the talents, the parable of the money given to the servants, that you can also have extra rewards. It's not that, that God's got specific particular favourites or, or that we're in a competition with anybody else, but he does suggest that we can build with hay and with straw and with things that will be burnt up, or we can build with things such as gold and silver and diamonds and those things that will remain. What are we building? What legacy are we leaving? Are you leaving a good legacy? Are you building into that legacy today? Every day we take a step, we're building that legacy. And what rewards do you think will be coming your way when you go to heaven? We read about Paul. We read this end of his life. This, we believe, is his last letter that we've got, that we, read, that we know of. There's so much there packed in that is entrusted to Timothy and to those believers that follow, and we're those that follow, and there's so much there for us. And I'd really encourage you, we've spent, I think, eight weeks in this over the last several weeks, but I'd really encourage you over this Christmas time, pick it up again, read through it again, reflect over the things we've spoken about. I think, I think everything's online, isn't it? I think you can go to YouTube, you can go to YouTube, you can see these messages again. Let it sink in. Because God really wants to speak to us. I don't believe that we've been looking at this for no reason at all. We've been looking because this is the, the, the verses, this is the period of time that we're to hear these verses. And this is the message for us for the time right now. Thank you for watching this week's message. 
For any more information or to find out more of what we do as a church, you can contact us at info at centrechurch.uk or check out our website at www.centre-church.uk.